Well, I've reached that point in my video odyssey through the world of George Orwell on screen. It's Michael Radford's 1984. There's so much to talk about with this one, and so I'm going to recommend the Criterion Collection Special Edition DVD and Blu-ray which came out in 2019. Not just because there's a 20 minute interview with me on it, I'm the least important person on this. Uh, there are also interviews with the writer-director Michael Radford and Roger Deakins, who's probably the most famous cinematographer in the world, I would have thought. Um, he got an early start on this movie. And as well as being interviewed on here, uh, he supervised the 4K digital restoration. So it's exactly how he wants it. But the story actually starts in Chicago and the office of a corporate lawyer, Marvin Rosenblum, who had no connections with filmmaking whatsoever. But he had this idea that if he could get the screen rights to 1984, and a movie came out in that year, it would market itself. So what he did was he, uh, he flew over to London and had a meeting with Orwell's widow, Sonia, who supervised the estate. And coming over on the plane, I mean, he practically memorized the work of Orwell so that he could schmooze Sonia. Uh, the problem he had was that she absolutely loathed and detested the previous attempt to turn it into a movie, the 1956 version, because, well, for one thing, it was, uh, it was a science fiction film, and she didn't like science fiction, and so when she finally agreed to sign the contract, uh, she stipulated that it could be nothing like Star Wars or 2001, A Space Odyssey, and she died just over a week later. The film of the book of the year. George Orwell's 1984. He tried to get various big name directors involved, Francis Ford Coppola, Hal Ashby, Milos Foreman. But as he touted it round the studios, nobody was interested in making this film. It, the story was too much of a downer, frankly. It wasn't life affirming. The forces of darkness and the treasonable maggots who collaborate with them must, can and will be wiped from the face of the earth. Now, depending on whether you talk to Radford or his producer Simon Perry, you get a slightly different story. But the upshot is that Rosenblum wound up forming a partnership with these guys who were a producer and director who'd made a low-budget film, Another Time, Another Place, about Italian prisoners of war in Scotland in World War II that had got a lot of good reviews and word of mouth and they were interested in, in working with him on this film. Uh, Perry had had dealings with Richard Branson's company Virgin which was moving into film production and he thought that they might go for this. The only problem was that uh, for a film, this was late 1983 and for a film to come out in 1984 they were really going to have to get a move on making it. And so uh, Radford went off to uh, his apartment in Paris and wrote the script in three weeks. It was an extraordinary experience, visualising and living in the world that George Orwell had created. Radford's one stipulation was that he'd only make the film if John Hurt played Winston Smith. Winston Smith, that's a British name. Yeah. Yeah and he approached him at an awards ceremony and, and Hurt readily agreed to this. Uh, it turned out, in fact, that Hurt was something of a, a fan of the book. He'd read it in the 1950s when he was growing up in Grimsby, the son of a clergyman, and it meant an awful lot to him, as did a lot of Orwell's work, funnily enough. I'm going to link to an Orwell Prize event from 2009 where Radford spoke in Oxford about the trials and tribulations and rewards of making the film. It's very, very interesting. Um, but he had a star who was essentially an alcoholic, but Hurt agreed that he would come off the source for the duration of filming. I and mean, this was going to be a high pressure uh, production. They had to get it out quickly. So that was the first thing. 
Secondly, when it came to writing the script, it, it is very faithful in many ways and is arguably a definitive version of the, uh, of the story. Uh, but it doesn't follow the rules of narrative that you'd expect. I mean, as Radford said, the hero is beaten and beaten and beaten to a pulp until finally he gives in. Actually, I'm not sure that, that this is a great novel. No. It's a great book. It's great. Uh, it's actually, in, in, in adapting it, in, in trying to bring it to the screen, I realised actually it's an essay. It's an essay couched in, in dramatical, uh, dramatic language, but with very archetypal characters whom inevitably I'm trying to bring to life. And the, and, and the, and the thing about cinema is that, is that it instantly, instantly exposes any narrative weakness in anything. Because people get it so fast that you have to be more rigorous in cinema than in any, any other art form with your narrative. And, the other, and one other thing is that um, Julia, who would be played by Susanna Hamilton, is a sort of um, Edwardian public school boy's idea of a nymphomaniac and so that character had to be changed a little bit. The, the thing, that quite apart from the fact that Julia is a real problem because um, you know all those are re unreconstructed male chauvinists with a sort of public school un undeveloped sense of what women actually are, a the under assistant matron uh, basically, um, whom he fantasized was going to um, have sex with him as many times as he could possibly imagine. I can imagine him under the bedclothes at school thinking about her. Now thirdly, when we come to the direction of the movie, it couldn't look futuristic. So what's the alternative? Well, the whole look of the film is that of the 1980s imagined by a writer in the 1940s, which is what it was. See this big hole here? Fill that up. Okay, thank you. And for this reason, the production design by Alan Cameron, who was just making the move over from television, was absolutely crucial. And this is a sketch of the Chestnut Tree Cafe. These are both sets that were built on the stage. And this third one was Victory Square, which is one of the major sequences, which is actually a location, which because it's a location, we obviously treat it slightly differently to a stage set. <laughs> Cameron had help from Kia and Louise Lusby, who had a film and TV prop making business. And uh, when I was writing my book, I had the privilege of going to see them at their home, because although they've worked on all kinds of brilliant productions down the years, Indiana Jones, Pirates of the Caribbean, Doctor Who, Blake Seven, uh, they didn't keep many of their props, but one prop they did keep was Winston Smith's Coral Paperweight. This was the very first one we made. I think this was the first one. And the problem was that when you put something like a piece of coral or anything into a, into a sphere, uh, solid, it magnifies it. And it's a bit like a snow scene, which we made many of. Um, and as soon as you put a little object inside a sphere that's solid or full of water, it gets a lot bigger. And they wanted to film through the the actual um, coral to see that, I think it was a note, a bank note, or some note, was it? I, I, I'd have to watch the film again. Um, and they said, no, it's far too big, so can you make it smaller? So we did it several times, going smaller and smaller and smaller with the coral until we ended up with a probably a piece of coral no bigger than your little fingernail, which got bigger inside but still left enough clear around for them to, to view through. But so I ended up with this one. Much of the location work in what was meant to be a, a London that was falling into ruin was done in the Docklands area of East London, particularly around the old Beckton gas works. And in fact, this would be used as Vietnam uh, the following year by Stanley Kubrick when he made Full Metal Jacket. The irony is that uh, that area is now very high class. They, they revamped it in ways you wouldn't believe and the apartments there sell for an absolute fortune. We've confidently expected to find the kind of ghastly places we were looking for in the north of Britain or in Scotland. In fact, every single one of them has come up in London. 
And when it came to Victory Square, which is meant to be Trafalgar Square, where the prisoners are paraded around and all that kind of thing, they had a really ingenious idea. They, they couldn't find an actual municipal square that would fit the bill. But then someone thought, well, what if we use Alexandra Palace? Now this building, which had actually been used by the BBC 30 years earlier to film some of the shots for the Peter Cushing 1984, it had a big fire in 1980, which gutted the inside of it. And somebody thought, well, how about if we film there and pretend that the inside walls are the outside walls of buildings. It made a marvellous square that we could get our trucks into and get, uh, dress exactly as we liked. And that sketch is basically the next process. It's almost unthinkable, but six weeks into filming, they still hadn't cast one of the three major characters, O'Brien. Uh, they tried Sean Connery, Paul Schofield, Rod Steiger, Marlon Brando. It just wasn't working out and in the end they approached Richard Burton, a notorious drunk that nobody would trust, nobody would insure and was pretty much a recluse in Haiti. Many years earlier Burton had been regarded as a great actor but at this point in his career after he'd done so many films for money and so many dreadful films like Exorcist to the Heretic he was regarded as a bit of a joke. There's a book from 1980 called the Golden Turkey Awards that names him as worst actor in all of Hollywood you know <laughs> so um, he didn't have a great reputation but they hired him in desperation and he puts in a remarkably nuanced and understated performance the famous Burton voice he uses at times almost in a whisper he was like no other actor I've ever worked with actually I have to say he was in what sense in the sense that he had this physical presence, this extraordinary physical presence, which was too big almost for the cinema, so you had to keep taking him down. And he had no real interest or perception, or didn't appear to have, in the psychology of the character. He got very good reviews for this, but by this point he died. He died weeks after filming ended uh, in his Swiss villa. He had a brain hemorrhage in his sleep. So after several delays the film was released in October of 1984 and in fact in some major territories such as America and Australia it didn't come out till 1985. I don't want to repeat too much what I said on here but one of the striking things about it is the sex and the violence, the explicitness of it, uh, the fact that you could get away with things in 1984 that you couldn't get away with in the 1950s. Um, the full frontal nudity of Julia, for instance. Um, uh, we don't get that from John Hurt, we just see his bum. But, you know, you get the picture. Do not touch one another. As for the violence and horror, well, the idea of having a rat cage strapped to your face was horrifying to BBC viewers in 1954, and the contraption that they used in the 1984 movie is just as grisly, if not more so, and um, not at all pleasant for John Hurt. These starving roots will shoot at you like bullets. Have you ever seen a rat leap through the air? Rats are not as wild as you think. So they'd come up and they'd look straight at me, making me cross-eyed looking at them. And they'd turn round and they farted straight in my face. The company Key Laboratories also invented a colour process for the film whereby some of the silver in the emulsion was left on the celluloid which takes out some of the yellow and what you essentially have is a halfway house between colour and black and white. But like it's just everything is very grey. Yeah. It's very like It's black. overcast <clears throat> all the time. Yeah. There's it's no colour. It's all cement. I mean the, uh, one of the uh, reviewers said that the whole film has the colour of murk. Um, so they weren't very impressed, but uh, it was a groundbreaking process and you can see the difference, in fact, by watching the trailer, which doesn't have it and looks very garish and colourful. You are beginning to accept it. We'll soon welcome it and finally become part of it. The film was released to respectful reviews and nihilistic young people really took to it, but that wasn't the end of the story by any means. There was big trouble brewing. The film went substantially over budget and 
Richard Branson wasn't very happy about this and one idea that he had to claw back some of his investment was to get the Eurythmics to produce a soundtrack album for it. Now, uh, David Bowie had been interested at one point in uh, doing the music for it. That didn't work out. Bowie had, in the 70s, had wanted to make a, a TV movie of 1984, but that didn't work out either. And in the end, uh, Radford got Dominic Muldowney to do a, quite a standard soundtrack, a very good soundtrack, which is included on the Criterion Blu-ray that I keep mentioning. To Michael Radford and Simon Perry's great annoyance, Virgin withdrew the film with Dominic Muldowney's soundtrack from cinemas and replaced it with the Eurythmics one. And so, when it came to the Evening Standard Film Awards and 1984 won the award for Best Film, with Richard Branson there in attendance, Michael Radford got up on stage and made a speech that just let rip. He told the world how unhappy he was about the situation. And I, and I stood up and told Richard, and it was live. And I stood up and I said, um, I know I'm supposed to you know, thank my mother for giving birth to me and my father, you know, for helping her. Uh, but um, I've got much more serious things to say. It's just the film that, that you're giving me this prize for is not the film that's out in the cinema today. And I cannot see how two artists, the Eurythmics, could insist that they, which they had and their music should be on the film. Well, the upshot of all that was the, the, the film moved. This was, at the, can you imagine, all, kind of all the drunken journalists and, and people at the, at the British Film Awards, somebody doesn't stand up and thank his agent and you know, everybody else, but just makes a speech. Everybody woke up like this. <laughs> the next day, it was on the front pages as opposed to the back pages. And the upshot was the following. Um, the movie shot to number one. <laughs> I was offered a huge, uh, gigantic picture by Dino De Laurentiis, <laughs> who said, who called me up from Italy, saying, uh, uh, I, "Saying I want you to do my next picture," and I said, um, "Yeah, Dino, but have you ever seen any of my work?" He said, "No." Nah. He said, "I saw you on television. You're a good guy." <laughs> There was a war of words in the press and open letters in the trade magazine, Screen International, and this all rumbled on for a while, but uh, I think it's all been patched up now. The film still has a lot of resonance, and after the election of Donald Trump, um, the people who didn't like him organised a national screening day at art houses across America and in other countries. Um, on 4th of April, which is the day that Winston Smith starts writing his Diary of Defiance. Regardless of political leanings, theater goers found plenty of food for thought. It's terrifying, it's like so frightening that how close we are to so much in the movie. The fake news, the double speak. There has been talk of another version being made. In 2017, The Hollywood Reporter referred to 1984 as the hottest literary property in town and it, Paul Greengrass was talked about as uh, he was in the frame for directing it but uh, that seems to have fallen by the wayside I think and the last I heard the BBC was sniffing around. Thanks for watching please like and subscribe and next time I'll be leaping forward 13 years to keep the Aspidistra flying the movie also known as a merry war. William Shakespeare wrote we are such stuff as dreams are made on. William Blake wrote, Tiger, Tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. Gordon Comstock wrote, Corner table enjoys his meal with Bovex. Well, you're not Shakespeare, and you're not quite William Blake. How can I be sure? I must finish this. It's needed by yesterday. Little rat-faced monster. I thought you loved me.